Welcome to Ancient Text Podcast. Book 5 of Historia Regum Britannia. We rejoin the book with King Lucius being very proud of his previous accomplishments, the introduction of Christianity to kingdom, and so forth. He allowed the temples of the old gods to be converted to churches, often granting these estates even more land. He died in Gloucester and was buried in the cathedral in the year 156 AD. He left no clear heir, so there was dissension as to who would rule. This news was brought to Rome, and the Roman Senate dispatched Severus with two legions to put Britain under full Roman control once and for all. Once he arrived, he was met with the armies of Britain, some of which swore their fealty to Roman power. The rest, after putting up several fights, fled to Northumbria. From there, led by Fulganius, they set out on raids, killing Romans and Britons alike, and were quite successful militarily. The emperor, who hasn't been named here, but is probably referring to Hadrian, being annoyed at these excursions from the north, ordered a wall to be built between Dera and Albania, which for a long time did help prevent attacks. A modern interpretation of this is that Hadrian's wall was built after the Romans had a hard time with the climate of Scotland, and also the famous Brocks of Scotland, which are like, they're like really old castles from the Bronze Age. They've been around since forever. Fulganius, when he saw the Romans truly had the upper hand, set out to Scythia to find more Picts, that they may help him in his endeavors. He successfully raised an army in Scythia and returned with a fleet to Britain and laid siege upon the city of York. Upon hearing this news, most of the Britons deserted the Roman Severus and went to help Fulganius. Severus wasn't phased. He called his remaining men together, went to the siege at York, and had a battle with Fulganius. The engagement was very dangerous, and Severus was killed in action. Fulganius was also mortally wounded. Severus was buried at York, after his legions were able to take it. Severus had two children, Basanius, who was part Briton, and Geta, who was full Roman. The Romans decided to advance Geta to status a king. The Britons were not having it. They wanted Basanius in charge, as he is one of them. The two brothers dueled over this, and Geta was killed, so Basanius became king. At this time, there was a young man in Britain named Carasius, who was considered a very great warrior. He traveled to Rome and asked the Senate for a fleet for which to drive away the barbarians from the coast. He promised them in turn to eventually gain and then hand over the government of Britain to the Senate. The Roman Senate liked this, so he was given his fleet. So Carasius proceeded to rape and pillage his own country, becoming the barbarian he said he was keeping out. He also looted all the nearby islands, i.e. Ireland, the Orkneys, the Araita. His shady doings attracted even more criminally-minded people to his cause. To the point he had a massive force no nearby army could compete with, he became prideful and told the Britons that if they would make him king, he would drive out all the Romans, the same Romans that had helped him in the first place. Oh, what a nice guy. This seemed like a popular enough notion. So in battle... Bostanius was betrayed by picked soldiers who feigned a retreat that caused a real retreat, causing his army to be defeated and the king himself to be killed. So Carasius effectively killed the king and took on the government of the kingdom. He then gave the Picts who had helped him land in Alba. When all this news came to Rome, the Senate commissioned Electus with three legions to kill the tyrant and restore Roman control of Britain. He arrived and battled Carasius and killed him and Electus took the government under his control. The Britons were not having it, so they advanced Aslapiadotus, Aslapiadotus, it's a heck of a name, to the Duke of Cornwall to be king. Under a new native throne Clement, the Britons in solidarity joined forces and marched against Electus and challenged him to battle. He was at the time in London celebrating a pagan feast. Being informed of the threat marching on him, he quit the feast and assembled his forces. The fight was bloody. Aslepiodotus gained the advantage and put the Roman army to flight, killing Electus in the bloody mess. After this, Livius Gaius, a friend of Electus, assembled the remaining Romans and holed themselves up in London. Aslepiodotus laid siege to London and informed all their Brythonic dukes that he had killed Electus and to come help capture London so they could finally be free of Roman subjugation. Accordingly, all races of the island came to the aid of Aslepiodotus. At his command, 
they successfully destroyed one of the walls of London and began pouring into the city. Gaius surrendered and so did his men. Asclepiodotus was going to treat Gallus and company as proper political hostages. But some of the British tribe of Venedotians swarmed the prisoners and decapitated them at, at a brook in the city, which according to Geoffrey, gave this river the Gaelic name Nat Gallum, which became the English name Gallumborn. The Romans being defeated, Asclepiodotus, with the consent of his people, crowned himself king and ruled peacefully for ten years. He sought much of the crime, which had become commonplace during all the previous political turmoil. About this time, Diocletian was in charge, and boy did that guy not like Christians. This book fails to mention anything pertaining to how this was implemented politically or otherwise, which is strange because the last thing it was talking about was how Rome was defeated in Britain. It simply states that Diocletian's repressions of Christianity did make it to Britain, he names one Maximanius Hercilius as being the local enforcer of these bans on scripture and burning of churches. Geoffrey goes on to describe this age of oppression very poetically, which, yeah, go figure, he's an ecclesiastical monk. He then names several Brythonic martyrs. Alban of the city of Varolam, Julius and Aaron, both from the city of legions. It seems to imply Alban may have been crucified. The two others were just plain brutalized to death, written here as being torn from limb to limb. Geoffrey then states that these martyrs were given VIP tickets to heaven. So to say. I, could, I cannot stress enough, this book sometimes is plain, does not make sense, and there's inconsistencies like this one here, where the Romans were defeated, but still Diocletian, Diocletian's uh, persecution of the Christians still made it to Britain, even though Rome was just defeated. So again, if it ever sounds like I'm doing something wrong or saying something weird, it's maybe me, maybe the book. Because, yeah, the book is strange in and of itself. Anyways, meanwhile, Cole, Duke of Caracolvin, or Colchester, made an insurrection against the king, Asclepiodotus. In pitched battle, he managed to kill the king. At this, the Romans rejoiced and said, Hey, time to subjugate this place again. So they sent a senator by the name of Constantius, who had conquered all of Spain. King Cole didn't feel confident in his ability to field an army against this particular Roman, so he sent out ambassadors as soon as they arrived, who agreed to again pay tribute if they could just have peace. To this, Constantius agreed, so they met up to exchange political hostages and make arrangements. Cole died a month later from sickness. After this, Constantius was crowned, and he married the daughter of Cole whose name was Helena. She was exceedingly beautiful and talented in music and liberal arts. Cole, Cole had no other heir, so he made sure she was very well educated. The two had a child, and it was named Constantine. Yes, that Constantine. Eleven years later, Constantius laid the reins of government in his son's Constantine's hand. Constantine then ruled Britain very justly, bringing peace to his peoples. Let's quickly cover the Roman historical narrative of Constantine's origins and dealings. It seems, according to the Romans, Constantine was born outside of Italy in Dacia or Serbia. He was declared Augustus in Germany. Britain accepted his rule quickly. Shortly after being made emperor, he resumed work in Britain, establishing roadways and military bases and defeating Picts in war. He also used to hang out in Britain while waiting out Roman civil wars, so he does in fact, according to Roman historians, have much to do with Britain, and seem to make an impact on the citizens, but of course, the events described is very different than what goes on in this book. Anyways, back to this book. Geoffrey says that at this time, Maxentius was a tyrant in Rome. He confiscated the property of nobles, and was a dick to everybody else too. People who were banished came to Britain to seek refuge under Constantine. They nagged Constantine asking, When are you going to help us get back home? You're the only one that could drive out Maxentius. Like, come on, bro, please. Don't you love my paraphrasing? This is also interestingly converse to how Roman history portrays things. In the end of Roman history, he was declared Caesar by a German king after his father, who was co-emperor, had died. While here in this book implies that Roman citizens begged him to go take over Rome. 
Eventually, moved by these requests, Constantine went to Rome and kicked Mastentia's ass and became emperor of Rome, which of course at this time was a ridiculously huge empire. Eventually, a man named Octavius, a British duke of a tribe called the Wyceans, wrestled the seat of government from the Roman proconsuls, which had been assigned there by Constantine. Constantine then sent Traherne, the uncle of his wife, to Britain, with a whopping three legions to do away with Octavius. The first battle occurred near Winchester. Octavius won, and Traherne fled to Scotland and wreaked havoc upon the countryside, prompting Octavius to engage in battle again. But this time, Octavius lost. Britain was once again under Roman control. Octavius fled to Norway. In Norway, he sought to obtain the assistance of the native king, Gombert. In the meantime, Octavius told his loyal followers to find any chance to assassinate Traherne. And indeed, a loyal noble with 100 men ambushed Traherne, successfully killing him. Octavius, hearing this, returned to Britain and dispersed the Romans and officially took the crown. He ruled with greatness and wealth, and feared no foreign power. He possessed the kingdom until the time Gratian and Valentinian were Roman emperors. In his old age, Octavius had no son and no obvious heir except a daughter. Some told him to give the crown to his daughter. Others advocated that his nephew, Conan Mariadoc, should take the throne, and the daughter married off for diplomatic purposes. A man named Caradoc, who was Duke of Cornwall, advised Octavius to marry the daughter to a Roman senator, Maximian, who was a cousin of Constantine's and half Brythonic himself, and have him become king of Britain. Caradoc argued surely this would be a very sound diplomatic move, as this was a noble Roman and a noble Briton by blood. Conan, the king's nephew, overheard this and made a ruckus in the court. Caradoc thought his idea was really good, so he sent his son to Rome to ask Maximian if he's down with the plan. Maximian was a large and bold man who liked to solve problems with violence. Maximian was also a man who was cheated out of being, you know, co-emperor with the rest of the emperors of Rome. He was promised he'd be given a third of the empire. Gratian and Valentinian cheated and split it two ways between themselves. Caradoc's son, knowing this, approached him saying, Why do you, Maximian, stand in fear of Gratian? when you have a good opportunity in front of you for wrestling the empire from him. Come with me into Britain, and you will take possession of the crown therein. King Octavius is now old and infirm, and needs someone deserving to hold a throne and marry his daughter. He has no male son, and therefore asks for advice from his nobles, who he should marry his daughter to. And they said that she should marry you, and that you should have the kingdom. I've been sent to bring you to the kingdom, but once you have it, you can use its treasures to restore yourself to the status of Roman emperor and drive out the other two and take the empire as Brythonic nobles before you, such as Constantine and Constius had. Maximian accepted to come to Britain and was pleased with the offer. On the way, with his forces, he subdued Frankish cities, getting much silver and gold and more fighting men. Afterwards, he set sail for Britain and arrived at Hamo's port. The king, hearing that some Roman general and his forces were landing, mistook this to be an invasion. The king called upon other contender to the throne, Conan, to lead his forces to meet the ones that were landing. Maximian had set up camps and saw the Brythonic army approaching. He was surprised at how large it was and had no clue what to do. Maximian called together a circle of his wisest men and asked what the hell they should do. A man named Marisius said, We aren't here to battle, let alone with a huge army, or to conquer. We should desire peace and a hospitable treatment until we can speak to the king himself. Let us tell them we are sent by the emperors on a diplomatic mission to the king, Octavius, and let us pacify these people with artful speeches. They agreed this was a good idea. Mauritius took twelve aged gray-haired wise men and went with literal olive branches, as Romans do, to meet Conan. The army let these emissaries pass into the ranks to speak to the commanders. They presented themselves to Conan Mariadoc. They saluted him in the name of the emperor and senate, which of course was a lie. They weren't actually there for Rome, you know. And said they were sent with Maximian to the king on a diplomatic mission by the two emperors, Gratian and Valentinian. Conan answered, why did he come with an army then? This doesn't look like a diplomatic mission. It looks like an invasion. Mauritius replied, 
Maximian is a big deal. He has lots of enemies around, so he needs soldiers. Even by his ancestry, he has many great real enemies. If he had just a small guard, he'd get taken out somewhere. You know, We come in peace, and to make peace. We've been peaceful since we landed, and we bought things fairly from locals, as peaceful people do, and have not done any pillaging or violence. Conan was unsure whether to start a battle or give them peace. Then Duke Caradoc of Cornwall and other nobles came and argued to Conan that he should not commence in battle. Conan wanted to fight, but under the pressure of his fellow nobles, he laid down his arms and granted them peace. Then he sent Maximian to London, where he gave the king an account of the whole proceeding. Caradoc then, along with his son Martius, commanded everybody to leave so he could speak to the king in private. He addressed the king like this. Behold, that which your more faithful and loyal subjects have long wished for is now, by the good providence of God, here. You commanded your nobility to give their advice how to dispose of your daughter in the kingdom, as being willing to hold the government no longer on account of your old age. Some, therefore, were for having the kingdom delivered to Conan, your nephew, and your daughter married off elsewhere, as fearing the ruin of our people. If any princess that is a stranger to our language should be sent over to us, Others were for granting the kingdom to your daughter and some noble man of her own country who would succeed you after death. But the greater number recommended some person descended from the family of the emperors on whom you should bestow your daughter and crown. For this promised a firm and lasting peace as the consequence of such a marriage, since they would be under the protection of the Roman state. See then, God has vouchsafed to bring you a young man who is both a Roman and also of the royal lineage of Britain. And if you follow my advice, you will not delay to marry your daughter to him. And indeed, should you refuse him, what right could you plead to the crown of Britain against him? For he is the cousin of Constantine and a nephew of King Cole, whose daughter Helena possessed the crown by an undeniable hereditary right. After Caradoc had spoken this to the king, King Octavius agreed and with the general consent of the populace, bestowed the kingdom and daughter upon Maximian. Conan Mariaduk, finding out what happened, was extremely offended. He went to Albania, or Scotland, to hide out and raise an army, so he could interrupt Maximian. Once he had a suitable army, he crossed the River Humber, and wasted the provinces on both sides of it. After this news, Maximian assembled his forces and met Conan in battle, and was victorious. But this was not a decisive blow to Conan. He fell back and reassembled his troops and continued to ravage the provinces. This proved to be a cyclical affair and provoked Maximian to come and do battle again, sometimes winning and sometimes losing. After a long slog of a back and forth war, they were brought to mediation by mutual friends and reached some diplomatic reconciliation. Five years later, Maximian, proud of his wealth, assembled a great fleet and all the armed forces in Britain. He was bored of just being king of Britain and fixated on taking over Gaul. He invaded Amorica, modern Brittany. He started hostilities towards the Celtic people in the area, but the Celts, under the command of Imbaltus, met them and engaged them in battle. Maximian won this battle, leaving 15,000 Celts killed. Maximian was glad at this because he now saw that subjecting this country would be easy. He called his old frenemy Conan, Conan Mariaduk, you know him, to speak and told him, we have already conquered one of the best kingdoms in Gaul. We may have hopes of getting the rest of Gaul. Let us make haste to take the cities and towns before a rumor of the danger they face spreads to remote corners of Gaul and raise all the people up in arms. For if we can get possession of this kingdom, I make no doubt of reducing all Gaul under our power. So don't worry that I took Britain. The, the potential kingship you lost to me will be restored to you here in this country. I plan to advance you to the throne of this kingdom. And this shall be another Britain, which we will people with our own countrymen and drive out the inhabitants. The land is fruitful and grain. The rivers abound with fish. The woods and forests are beautiful and pleasant. Nor is there any, in my opinion, a more beautiful country. Hearing this, Conan submissively bowed and thanked him and swore his loyalty to Maximilian. What we just read was Geoffrey's explanation for the founding of Brittany, which is on the west coast of France. It is a place where Brythonic culture was preserved, in a sense, longer than it was in Britain itself. The country was a major political player through the Middle Ages, and it becomes a major actor in the book after, 
after this uh, after this point. The academical historical explanation says much less than this book does. Basically, that it began as a colony, and many fled there during the conquest of Britain by the Anglo-Saxons. Geoffrey gives us a cool story here, which can not really be proven or unproven. But as things stand, this is actually kind of a nice bit of historical insight. There's little anyone else says about the founding of Brittany. To avoid any confusion, Brittany is Armorica, and it's going to be referred to as Armorica in this book. A um, bit of insight, the traditional Celtic name for it seems to be Lidwickham. But yeah, in this book it's called Armorica. Back to the book. After Conan was crowned king of Armorica, they marched with their forces to Redunum and took it the same day. The citizens of the town, hearing of the brutal and courageous acts of the Britons, fled the town, leaving their wives and children behind. Other cities followed this example, knowing that the Britons would kill any men they found in this conquest. At last, when they had eradicated the inhabitants of all these provinces, they garrisoned the cities with Brythonic soldiers and made several fortifications. Maximian's exploits were heard about all across of Gaul. All the dukes and princes were dreadfully concerned and felt hopeless except to pray to their gods. Maximian, seeing this, paid gifts to his soldiers and hired all soldiers he could find. He paid well, and so he easily found plenty of soldiers and kept them loyal. He halted making war for a while, though, so that he might bring more Britons into Armorica first. He made a decree and assembled 100,000 of his countrymen who came into Armorica, and he also furnished the province with 30,000 soldiers. Indeed, all had gone according to plan, and Maximian made Conan Mariadoc king of his new Britain. Maximian then went with his vast army and conquered all of Gaul. Not just Gaul, but also Germany. The seat of this empire he established was in the city of Triers in western Germany. He took on the Roman emperors. There were two at the time. Geoffrey lists them again as Gratian and Valentinian. Maximian terrorized them and killed one of them. This part of the book is suddenly very lacking in details, but says simply he chased the other out of Rome at some point. Meanwhile, the Gauls near Armorica were harassing Conan and his country. They invaded frequently, but every time Conan defeated them. Conan figured his soldiers deserved wives, but they did not want to mix with the continental Celts, so he sent to Britain to send over women. Messengers were directed to Dianotus, king of Cornwall, who was the brother of Caradoc. He was a noble and powerful prince, who was left to run Britain under the orders of Maximian, as of course Maximian was out taking over the world. Dianotus also had a beautiful daughter that Conan was in love with. Upon receiving the message, Dianotus summoned together young noble women from noble families in all the provinces of Britain. There was a total of 11,000 of them. Maximian got boats together to ship them over. Some of the women were excited. Most had rather to stay in Britain. Some wanted to remain virgins, but they were all shipped off regardless. They shipped out off the river Thames into the sea. Then the wrong winds began to blow and disperse the fleet. In the ensuing storm, most ships capsized, but the women who escaped the danger of the sea found themselves ashore strange islands, whose barbarous inhabitants either killed them or made them slaves. The hands they f had fell into were that of Ganius and Melga, who under instruction from the Roman Emperor Gratian were wreaking havoc in Germany. Ganius was a king of the Huns and Melga a king of the Picts. While plundering these women, they realized a lot of them were virgins. Pretty virgins of that. So they made great attempts to court these virgins. And of course the virgins who were bummed at the prospect of marrying even their own countrymen were like, ew, no. So these barbarous people murdered as many as they could. After this, the Picts and Huns realized that Britain was defenseless as all the men had either joined Maximian's army, which was out and about on the continent, or had gone to settle Armorica. So the Picts and Huns invaded and laid waste to Britain brutally, facing no opposition as if they were slaughtering pens of sheep. Maximian heard of these grievous acts, and currently chilling in Rome, assumingly with the emperors temporarily subjected to him, the book gets confusing here, and I'm trying to disseminate the information in some less confusing way, Maximian sent two legions to alleviate the violence happening in his own land. In a bloody victory, the legions Max sent went and they won, and forced the Huns and Picts into Ireland. In the meantime, Maximian was assassinated by friends of the Emperor Gratian, 
and Max's grand army was dispersed. Many returned to Armorica, which was now called the Utter Britain. That's the end of this section of the book. These last few chapters get a bit confusing, and I wonder if it's a translation error. If I could speak Latin, I would look into it, as this was originally written in Latin. This whole podcast is me putting this into understandable English in my mind. But it was quite confusing as to what happened between Maximian and the Roman emperors, and whether Gratian was friendly or subservient to Maximian at any point, and what exactly Maximian was doing in Rome. Oh, hey. I finished writing the episode exactly on the Ides of March. Rest in peace, Caesar.